I love it too. <laughs> In the land of cotton Old times, they are not forgotten Look away, look away Look away, Dixieland Oh, I wish I Dixieland, where I was born. Early Lord, one frosty morn. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. Well, you'd think I've learned what my cue was by now, wouldn't you? Jeez. Sorry, I should have. I should have told you, Jason is such a ham. You know, it just had to go on and on, didn't it? Sorry about that. My fault. <laughs> not at all. Um, just so everybody knows, Simon is related to Jason. He's not just being really mean to. Um, but before we get the hat back out, I'm going to have to show you this. I mean, the seam is the new Vera. I just love it. 
Thank you for that, Danny Marshall. That has just brought tears of joy to my eyes. Everybody, give me a drum roll, please. Here's the next one. I don't know if you can see my son's scribbles on the back of that, but um, that definitely does say Geetha Lodge. Geetha Lodge is a multi award winning playwright, novelist and writer for video games and screen. She has a profound addiction to tea, crosswords and awful puns. And that's why we're friends. Geetha's debut novel, She Lies in Wait, has been published in, by public, no, by Penguin Random House in the US and UK and has also been translated into 12 other languages. Ooh. It became an international bestseller in 2019 and was a Richard and Judy book club pick, as well as a Sunday Times and New York Times crime pick. <gasps> Geetha, thank you for gracing us with your presence. <laughs> it's lovely to be here. <laughs> what have you got for us this evening? So I thought, given that book four in the Jonah series is out in April... And it's, it's not yet been announced and it's not yet been publicised, but I thought here was the perfect time for a bit of a sneak peek. So I'm going to read a little bit of, well, in fact, the very opening of book four. Um, and uh, those of you who are reading the series will know that I left Jonah on a little bit of a personal cliffhanger at the end of book three. Um, but I would also like to add that to anyone who hasn't read any of them before, I have tried to write them so you can drop in on any of them and still understand what's going on. So this hopefully shouldn't be uh, too difficult to, uh, to get on board with. So here we go, book four, and it's called Little Sister. It's out in April, um, and I can't wait to, uh, to reveal it all to you. It was far warmer than a September afternoon had any right to be. At 4 p.m., it must have been almost 30 degrees in the garden of the spread eagle. Jonah checked on Millie as one of the waitresses deposited a pint of lager on the picnic table. She was soundly asleep under the pram's parasol, soothed by the heat and the background chatter. Jonah lifted the glass of lager, intensely aware of the condensation under his hand and of the very slight breeze that slid across his arms. It was such a rare moment of peace and normality that he felt drunk on it, even before he'd started to sink the 4% but he was still two thirds of the way down the glass before he knew it. The alcohol added its slightly fuzzy halo to everything. And he found himself smiling at a couple with two young toddlers as they walked over to the climbing frame. He felt optimistic for the first time in a while that everything would work out all right, that he'd be messing around with Millie like that in a few years, side by side with his partner. He was still watching them when a figure emerged through the trellised archway from the road. He glimpsed her at the edges of his vision, registering long hair of a brilliant red. Part of him picked up something else. That she looked grubby, maybe. And he turned to look. Jonah realised that the grubbiness was blood. That her t-shirt was daubed in it. Her hands covered in a coating of rust red, almost up to her elbows. For a moment, he wondered whether this was what sleep deprivation did to you, whether it blurred the boundaries between the innocence of his family life and the terrible violence of his work, whether this might be no more than a hallucination. But then other diners started to turn and a quiet began to wash over the garden. After a few instants, there was only the light buzz of music from inside the pub and noises of effort from the two children as they kept climbing, oblivious. That blood was real, he thought, and having understood, he tried to work out where it had come from. There was no evidence that it was hers, no bloom of it to show a source, just a great river of red down her t-shirt and daubs of it over her hands. Jonah tried swiftly to work out whether she was in trouble, whether she'd just witnessed a terrible accident. She was young, he thought, a teenager, and she came to a complete stop a few paces into the garden, as if she'd run out of the momentum needed to keep going. There was no question in Jonah's mind that he should be the one to step forwards. The moment this young woman had entered the garden, she had become his responsibility. Before that, really, from the moment the blood had been shed on her. She gazed round at the drinkers, with a strangely unconcerned expression. 
There was no shame, no anxiety, but also none of the signs that Jonah had come to expect from a girl who had experienced trauma. None of the usual ones, at least. She looked, if anything, slightly amused. He got to his feet and took a step forwards, his hand going to the handle of the pram to keep it near him. Are you all right? he asked her. There were hurrying footsteps from the pub. In the periphery of his vision, he saw a waitress emerge from the door with a pair of plates and then falter as she saw the scene in front of her. The girl smiled at him, though it wasn't a warm smile. It was almost as if she'd been expecting him to ask and found it funny. I could do with a drink, she said. Jonah nodded. All right, come to the bar and I'll get you one. He felt very much aware as he escorted her into the pub that everyone was now watching both of them. They were now imagining, him, imagining that he knew her, assuming that this was somehow his fault. It was lucky that Jonah had never cared that much about what most people thought. The young woman moved ahead of him into the pub and he lifted the pram over the threshold and followed her. He became momentarily blind in the dimness before he shoved his sunglasses up onto his head. The girl was already walking towards the bar. There was, as ever, no real sense of a queue, just a mass of people near the bar, all immersed in their menus and shooting each other occasional side-eyed glances in case they lost their place. But they made way for him, or actually, for her. Lemonade? Jonah asked, his eyes on the nearest barman. He could see that the guy had understood that he was going to serve this blood-smeared girl next, no matter who was waiting. Sure, she said, with ice. Jonah watched her as the barman began to move. He studied the pale eyes as she looked around, her tall frame, the lean, strong look, at her, look of her. I'm Jonah, he said, and then after a moment he added, I'm a detective. I work with the police. She looked back at him, her gaze showing no curiosity. Keely, do you need our help? He could hear the lemonade hissing into the glass now. There was nothing else to listen to. The whole room full of people were watching the two of them. Keely narrowed her eyes at him briefly and said, I don't need help. But maybe Nina does. Nina? Jonah asked. My sister, Keeley said, her voice light, almost merry. Jonah's eyes moved to the blood coating her arms, and he asked, where is Nina? Keeley's amusement turned into a brilliant, knowing smile. Oh, I'm not going to tell you yet, detective. That would be too easy. stuff thank you so much for that oh that's it <laughs> um i do remember on a very very early v not b you reading from one of your novels where somebody gets murdered on on a webcam oh yeah so yes yeah, they being, get murdered over zoom <laughs> oh, just being so frightened <laughs> <laughs> um thank you and thank you for sharing that exclusive with us as well um i too, I'm very aware of what sleep deprivation can do. So um, thank you for that, but hopefully I won't be murdering anyone anytime soon. Um, <laughs> see you very soon, Geetha, and thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I can't wait to see you in February. And you. Hi. <laughs> the hat is out. One more, please. It's Geordie Boy, Howard Linsky. Howard is a best-selling author of crime and historical fiction, and I believe he's revealed today that he's been doing some ghostwriting for somebody as well. That's true. Yeah. His debut novel, The Drop, was voted one of the top five thrillers of the year by the Times newspaper, and The Damage was voted one of its top summer reads. Ooh! His David Blake series was optioned for TV by Harry Potter producer David Barron. Howard writes a series of naughty set crime fiction novels, The Penguin Random House, featuring investigative journalists Tom Carney and Helen Norton, as well as Detective Sergeant Ian Bradshaw. Originally from the Northeast, Howard now lives in Welland Garden City with his wife and daughter, and we are 
delighted to be welcoming him home in February. So Howard, what are you going to be reading for us tonight? Right, well thanks Vic for having me on today and it's, it's certainly whetting the appetite for the actual Bay Tales, the proper one, when we come back to Whitley Bay that'll be excellent. Um, I've taken a bit of a leap of faith today though, normally I would read from whatever book had been published this year but I thought I would give you a, a sneak preview of a work in progress uh, which I'm starting to worry about because nobody's actually read this, not even my editor at this point so it's kind of brand new. <clears throat> it's called The Inheritance. There's a clue in the title because it follows um, the story of a young lady called Sarah who uh, inherits a large and rather spooky manor house, 15th century, a 16th century, sorry, manor house. Uh, and she gets a large sum of money as well, but it is conditional. She has to do something to earn it. So having dropped that little clue in, I'm going to start from the beginning of the book uh, and read to you for about six minutes or so um, with a little idea about what's going on in that one. So all being equal, if I do finish it, hopefully, fingers crossed, this one will be out next year. Chapter one. Did you bring it? The old lady asked with the urgency of an addict needing a fix. Yes. He showed her the canvas bag he was carrying and as he took his seat opposite her, he set it down on the floor next to him. But this isn't strictly necessary, Evelyn, not if there's a will. She snorted. Wills can be contested, Dickie. This one probably will be. I want to be sure I'm taken seriously. Then no one can say she didn't mean it. The batty old dear had obviously lost her mind at the end. Oh, I'm sure no one would. She cut him off. Money brings out the worst in people. Distant relatives come crawling out of the woodwork and start grasping for everything. I will not have it, you hear? As you wish, the solicitor demurred. Set it up then? She was getting impatient. Evelyn was nearly always impatient. She hated to waste time on pleasantries and low small talk. Heaven help anyone in Nain enough to remark upon the changeability of the weather. She would give them what he always called her death stare. He began to rummage in the bag for the equipment. I haven't got all day, she reminded him. Time is the one thing I do still value. Evelyn watched as her solicitor took the video camera out of the bag and then placed it on the tripod, turning the camera so that the lens was pointing straight at her. He checked the framing to ensure he could see her face clearly and decided it would do. Is it ready? she asked. Yes, he confirmed. All I have to do now is press this red button. Good and she gave him a questioning look as to why he wasn't doing just that. Okay, he said, on three. Then he paused to make sure she understood before counting. One, two, three. He pressed the button and sat back as quietly as he could. Evelyn sat up straight, her face serious, her voice clear. I, Evelyn Moore, being absolutely of sound mind, do hereby leave everything I own to my niece, Sarah Green. And she paused for a second, perhaps for emphasis, and even leaned a little closer to the camera, before adding, on one condition. Chapter two. Twenty minutes later, she was done. She didn't mess around. Every moment had to be used, not wasted. He thought of Kipling then. If you can, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run. That was Evelyn Moore, all right. Why now, he had asked her, when she insisted he come today. I've been on at you for years to get your estate in order. I know, she waved her hand at him. But who really wants to face their own mortality when they can just ignore it and press on? It wasn't urgent before. Oh, and he asked gently. And it is urgent now. I'll be gone by the end of the year, she told him matter-of-factly. And he had to disguise his shock. What was she? Seventy? How could this whirlwind be dying? Dickie sat silently through the whole recording while even outlined her wishes and the reasoning behind them, and the camera caught it all. When it was over, she fell silent until he turned off the camera, and she waited for his response. Her solicitor had handled every legal transaction Evelyn had been involved in ever since he had helped her agent with the finer points of a publishing contract. You did a decent job on that, she had told him then. Now I want you to buy me a house, then she said, and not just any house. I want you to buy me Cragsmoor. And for added complication, she said, and no one can know it's me, not even the seller, especially the seller. 
That was more than 30 years ago when Dickie was still a relatively young man. Somehow he'd managed to purchase the house for though they were quite possibly the most fraught and stressful months of his life. Now he regarded her for a long moment without saying anything at all until finally the dam burst and he summoned the courage to tell it to her straight. I arrived here convinced you were still very much of sound mind, Evelyn. Now, however, I am duty bound to ask the question, have you gone stark raving mad? He braced himself for the storm that would surely follow, but in true contrarian fashion, Evelyn burst out laughing. It was almost a cackle. Maybe I have. She nodded her head slowly before him, adding a second, quieter, maybe I have. He waited for more, and she settled on. But it's my money, Dickie, and I've no brats to leave it to. The great author was indeed childless. But you do have family, he reminded her in case she'd forgotten. Apart from this niece, Sarah, he snapped, as if he had forgotten her name. The only one worth a damn. The rest can whistle. I'm not leaving them a penny. That's your prerogative. He wasn't going to argue with her about that. You can do what you want with your money. It's just the... He began the sentence with no idea how to end it. And now he was grasping for words, hoping they would come to him as he went along. Unusual nature of your bequest uh, to Sarah? It is conditional. And the condition, if you don't mind me saying so, or even in fact if you do, is stop waffling, man. She cut him off. I know it's not normal, but what part of my life has ever been normal? I'm not doing this out of eccentricity or ego. I don't need any more publicity. In fact, I want you to keep it as quiet as possible and would strongly urge Sarah to do the same, to keep the bloody newspapers off the scent. Look, I'm in full control of all my faculties and we'll get my doctor to write you a note confirming this if you think that's wise. It might be, he conceded. Someone was bound to challenge a will containing such strange conditions. I'm expecting you to defend me. You will be my representative here on earth, Dickie, once I have left it. Make them understand. Tell them what I want and why I want it. Why do you want this? Justice, she told him. Plain and simple. People read my books and write articles about what I meant by this or that. And the themes I explore in my writing. She sounded contemptuous. Evie didn't enjoy anyone trying to analyse her. Love, hate, revenge, betrayal. She listed some of them. But they all missed the most obvious one. Justice for the victims of murder and those left behind to mourn. Of course, it seemed obvious now. But I never got that, she explained. In my books, there are no loose ends. I never cheat my readers. She took a deep breath then, as if this was all a bit of an effort. But real life isn't like that. I spent 36 years with a very dark cloud hanging over mine. My dear friend was taken from me. She disappeared one day and not a trace of her was ever found. There was no body for burial, no funeral service. She was never even officially declared dead. There was no end to her story. The grief was made worse by my inability to explain her disappearance. It became my obsession. Why do you think I asked you to buy me that house? I thought I'd find the answer somewhere in her family home, but no. She looked so sad then. I'll be in my grave soon. I don't believe in the afterlife. I think you have one go at this, and if you mess it up, well, tough. I doubt Lucy will be waiting for me on a cloud with the name of her killer on her lips, because make no mistake, she was murdered, Dicky. I just don't know who it was or why, though I have my suspicions. I have to accept that I will die never knowing the truth, but that does not mean I have to give up. Let someone else pick up the baton. Have them go over it all again with a fresh pair of eyes. I have come to the belated conclusion that I was too close to Lucy to ever see this one clearly. Perhaps my niece will finally solve this mystery for me and get justice for Lucy. If she can do that within a year, then she will inherit everything. If not, then it goes elsewhere. So she gets the lot, he said. But she has to catch a killer first. Exactly. But the police and the victim's family couldn't, he reminded her. What makes you think Sarah might be the one to solve it? because I firmly believe that my niece is a genius. That's it, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Howard. I don't, think, I don't think there'll be any worries from your editor. Thank you very much for <laughs> sharing that with us. Um, <laughs> and of course, we'll see you at Newcastle Noir before we see you in at Bay Tales and Whitley as well. Yes, very much looking forward to Newcastle Noir as always, a fabulous event. Yes, can't wait for it. Thank you very much. And we'll see you in December and then again in February. Thanks, Vic. Take care now. Bye.
We have three readers left, so who will be next? It is. One more, please. Nikki May. Born in Bristol, raised in Lagos, Nikki May is Anglo Nigerian. She ran a successful ad agency before turning to writing. Her debut novel, Wahala, was inspired by a long and very loud lunch with friends. It will be published around the world in January 2022 and is being turned into a major BBC TV drama. Woo! She lives in Dorset with her husband, two standard schnauzers and way too many books. Everybody, huge round of applause for Nikki May. Hiya, Nikki. Hi, thanks for having me. So this snippet is from a third the way into the book and Boo has decided out of nowhere that she's sick of her wavy bob and she wants a full Pam Greer big afro. So Ronke has taken her to her hairdressers in Peckham for a weave. Glasses on. Did I tell you what happened to Auntie Kay last weekend? Ronke asked. She knew she hadn't, but she wanted to start this story casually. No, what? Boo turned to face Ronke. Keep your head straight, ma, said Fifi. I am holding big needle, eh? Please don't call me ma, said Boo for the fourth time. I'm sorry, ma, said Fifi. It's going to be big, one big fro, said Ronke. Boo's hair was now a spiral of cornrows snaking round her head. Fifi was stitching on hair extensions, wefts of fizzy brown and blonde hair. I look like a mollusk, said Boo. The bridge should be tighter, eh, said Fifi. This is not lasting a long time. It's tight enough. Boo peered in the mirror. I look like I've had a facelift and I think it's too long. I don't want to be Shaka Khan. I'm cutting it after, ma, said Fifi. She muted the sound on the TV. Sister Ronke, you are telling us about your auntie. She pronounced it auntie. It made Ronke feel homesick. In Nigeria, everyone older than you was an auntie or an uncle. It was terrible. She'd only been home for two weeks when it happened, said Ronke. She ate the last piece of kelewele and wiped her hands on a napkin. She'd heard the story three times now, first from Uncle Joseph, then Auntie Kay, and finally her cousin Obi. She'd told it three times to Rafa, Kayade, and Kayade's sister Yeti. It got more exaggerated with each retelling. She spun her chair around so she was more central, then decided standing would be more dramatic. This was proper Niger gist. It had to be told in the right way, in a loud voice with lavish gestures. It was a regular Sunday, Ronke began. Auntie Kay had been to Lagos for the weekend. After church, she set up for home, an easy two hour drive. Auntie Kay is always careful. She never uses the expressway at night, doesn't venture out after dark. She keeps the doors locked and windows wound up and all her valuables, even her wedding ring, were sashed in her handbag, hidden in the footwell. She'd even put her dummy bag on the passenger seat. What's a dummy bag, asked Boo. A cheap bag to fool the robbers, standard practice in Lagos. Auntie Kay has a set of keys, a broken phone, and some old makeup in hers. It's a decoy. If you get carjacked, the thieves snatch it and run. By the time they get found out, fingers crossed, you're miles away. Bloody hell, said Boo. Lord, in your mercy, protect us. Fifi touched her hand to her forehead, chest and shoulders. Ronke paused, worried Fifi would stab herself with the big needle. Once Fifi was safe from puncture wounds, she resumed. Now, Auntie Kay isn't rich and her car isn't flashy. We're talking dusty five-year-old Sienna. No leather seats, no aircon, no central locking. A standard to Kumbo. To Kumbo? Boo stumbled over the word. A used car, you know, second hand. Ronke had got so carried away with her story, she'd forgotten how little Boo knew about life in Nigeria. It means from across the sea, an import. By this point, Fifi had stopped working on Boo's hair, the comb and needle abandoned. She held one hand up to her face, a stricken but eager expression on it. Even Boo looked spellbound, if a little odd with a quarter of an afro. Ronke turned her voice up a notch. So, Auntie Kay's on the expressway, singing along to her church programme, thinking about supper. She was pretty sure she had some Eddie Kaikor soup in the freezer. 
Then, out of nowhere, a car zooms up beside her and forces her off the road, onto the hard shoulder. This is Nigeria, Boo, so the hard shoulder is not a safe haven. It's potholed and full of crap. Old burst tyres, burned out cars, you don't know what's lurking there, or who. Oh, my sweet Jesus, Fifi crossed herself again. Bloody hell, whispered Boo. Auntie Kay's trembling like a leaf, cursing the idiot who ran her off the road. She's taking deep breaths. Crash! Ronka clapped her hands together. Fifi and Boo jumped gratifyingly. The driver's side window explodes, Ronka continued. A shower of tiny shards of glass rains down. Auntie Kay thinks it's a bomb. Rough hands yank her out of the car. Someone is shouting, but she has no idea what they're saying. She's thrown down onto the hot, filthy tarmac. Three men are leaning over her. They have machetes in their hands. Her wrapper is pulled open. She knows this is the end. She's going to be raped and murdered. Pray God, save her, auntie, breathed Fifi. Bloody hell, said Boo. Then God speaks to Auntie Kay. He tells her to sing, to sing for her life. Ronka realised she'd gone a bit RuPaul on the last line, Rafa's influence. So she closes her eyes, crosses her hand around her chest and bellows at the top of her voice. The God speaking hadn't actually happened. Ronka had added that bit for Fifi's benefit. She considered lying on the floor doing a full arms crossed impression, but the salon was dirty. She sang, aiming for soprano, improvising as she didn't know the tune. Save me, Jesus, save me, Jesus, from this God-forsaken place. Ronka paused to ramp up the tension. Then what, said Boo? Sweet holy Jesus, said Fifi. The next thing she hears is a sweet, soft voice asking if she's okay. Auntie Kay opens her eyes and there's a beautiful woman dressed in white, an angel, kneeling beside her and telling her she's safe. Turns out the thieves were scared of God and they scarpered. A passing car had seen it all and stopped to help. The driver of that car was the angel, a nurse in uniform. She picked Auntie Kay up, dusted her down, and gave her an escort all the way home to be battled. Oh, yame, ye! God is truly wonderful. He works in mysterious ways, said Fifi. That's it. I'm never going to Nigeria again. Shit happens everywhere, said Ronke. That's it. Thank you so much for that and it was totally worth waiting for for this thing in there thank you <laughs> um, I, I love the characters i love them all i can't wait to um because it's going to be me interviewing your panel hey i can't wait to be in whitley bay i've got friends <laughs> today with, it's a little holiday for us yay um well i can't promise you sunshine but i'm sure we'll have lots of fun <laughs> thank you so much for that nikki See you soon. Um, okay, we have two. We don't have two. That's a worry. I'm going to have to do some checking in a minute. The one that we did have in the hat was lovely Russ Thomas, who was born in Essex, raised in Berkshire, and now lives in Sheffield. After a few proper jobs, among them pot washer, opticians receptionist, supermarket warehouse operative, call centre telephonist and storage salesman, Russ discovered the joys of book selling where he could talk to people about books all day. His debut novel, Fire Watching, was Waterston's crime novel of the month in November last year. Woo Russ will be on the killer twists to perfect plotting panel that's a tongue twister, with Louise Candlish, Kate Ruby and Sarah Vaughan. That panel will be chaired by the ebullient Derek Farrell. And Russ is joining us despite some toothache tonight, so everyone be very lovely and kind to him. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Hello. I suppose tell everyone that. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> what an act to follow. I can promise you I'm not going to sing though, so um, hard cheese. <laughs> um, what I thought I'd do was, uh, unlike, uh, unlike several other people, is read from my new book, which nobody's heard before. Um, it's not out till May next year, um, but in the meantime, the paperback to this little beauty 
is out on the 11th of November, so you've got plenty of reading to do before then. Um, so this is an, a little exclusive for you. This is from my new novel, um, which is going to be called Cold Reckoning. Edith pushes her hands deeper into her fleece against the cold, exhales a cloud of water vapour and crunches her way down the snow-covered bank, stumbling onto the narrow path around the lake. A startled moorhen flaps its way across the ice and disappears into a dark thicket. Edith smiles. She's the first human to tread here this morning. Not surprising given the hour, and her size five caterpillars leave patterned tracks behind her in the almost perfect snow. Almost perfect, because though she may be the first human being to pass this way, she's not the first creature. The sharp pronged prints of birds crisscross the path ahead of her lit by the glacial light of an almost full moon. And something larger, a fox maybe, or a small badger, something with fat padded paws that have left deep imprints in the snow. She slips her phone from her pocket and snaps a quick pic so she can look it up later and add it to her diary. Maybe she'll ask Mrs. Peters if she recognizes it. Her hands crackle in the biting cold and the three metal studs in her right ear are aching. She's beginning to regret shaving her head quite so thoroughly yesterday. She prefers to keep it as short as possible, less hassle that way, and less chance Alice Clitheroe can attach chewing gum to her in economics. But maybe she should have settled for the number three guard this time, at least until the weather gets warmer. She tucks her hands back into her pockets and moves on along the path. When she walks, it's for the sake of walking and she varies her route with her mood she sets out early, sometimes 4 or 5 a.m., and enjoys the way the landscape wakens with the dawn. Sometimes she heads west toward Bradfield, or if she feels like going the full distance, she'll follow the River Don as it winds its way north and west through Deepcar towards Peniston. The river's a constant companion, stretching away towards its source deep in the Pennines. She never has the time to go that far, but one day she will, she promises herself. There's something about moving backward along the flow of a river that makes her feel as though she's traveling through time, walking into history, rooting the water as it barrels towards her on its endless journey. This is her time, the small part of the day she carves out for herself, away from responsibility. For the rest of the day, people will want things from her, her mother, her teachers, even Alice Clitheroe. She has many roles to play and she knows them all well. But this short window of opportunity at the start of the day is just for her, a couple of hours before her mother wakes and calls out in pain, real or imagined, Edith isn't sure anymore. This morning though, she settles for a quick circuit of Damflask Reservoir. She's been here a lot lately, but because the snow is likely to slow her down, it makes sense to pick a shorter route than some of the others. She can't afford to be late to school, not again. And there's the dark, the reservoir's better lit than the river, the silvery moonlight reflecting off the vast expanse of water and the cold blue blanket of snow. Now she's off the main road though, she's beginning to rethink her choice. It's becoming a chore just to lift each foot and put it down again in front of her. She doesn't think she'll get much further before she's forced to turn back. The gunshot, when it comes, cracks loudly across the lake, startling a number of birds into flight. Edith stops, the hair raised on the back of her neck and arms, her heart beating in her chest as she listens to the echo fade. Birdsong slowly returns to, the, to fill the empty space left behind. She knows what a gunshot sounds like. She's grown up around farms. It has a distinctive deep crack, not at all like a car backfiring, like they're always saying on those old cock shows her mother watches all the time. Edith's not even sure what a car backfiring is. No, that was a gunshot, she's positive. She glances around, unsure which direction the sound came from. It could be a hunter, she supposes, but people don't hunt at the reservoir, do they? Still, if it is a hunter, she doesn't want to be mistaken for a deer, so she quickens her pace and decides to head back to the main road above rather than finish circumnavigating the lake. The path opens out before reaching the main road, and there's an abandoned boat shed here with a concrete slip leading down into the half frozen water. In the summer, it's busy with canoeists and sailors and all those people who seem to love messing around on the water. But this morning, the area is empty. 
Edith's almost level with the old shed when the man steps out and stops, staring straight at her. There's a bare bulb hanging above the door and her own pace slows as their eyes lock in the eerie orange light. There's something about the man, or perhaps it's the sound of the gun still echoing inside her mind that makes her instantly wary. There's no one else around, not so much as a lone car passing on the road above. Still, he stares and Edith's pace slows further. He's slightly ahead of her, but the path to the road branches off here and the ground beneath her feet's already rising. A few more paces and she'll be the one ahead. The man raises a hand in greeting and says something. She can't quite make it out and yet his intent seems clear. Hey, can I trouble you for a moment? Or perhaps, morning, you couldn't just give me a hand? His body language is open, friendly. He just needs a moment of her time. Edith finds herself slowing further, unwilling to fully commit to stopping, but too polite to ignore someone who's addressing her directly. But then she sees his eyes and they say something entirely different. She's seen that look before, or something like it. It raises her hackles, provokes some primal instinct that she's long been in tune with, and Edith runs. Thank you so much for that, Russ. Um, got a question from Michael Swindells. He says you use Sheffield and the surrounding area as a backdrop for action. What draws you to it? Um, it's where I live, <laughs> so it's easy for research. <laughs> um, it's a brilliant place because it's a city, a big city, the fourth largest in the country, and yet it's quite a small city centre and has huge variety of landscape around it. And there's the Peak District and, and everything. So you've got ev you've got every kind of different sort of location you could you could ask for. Really, I think that, that's what I love about it most. It's very hilly, and there, there seem to be a lot of um traveling fairs really i've seen some pictures oh yeah yeah okay yeah so where i live <laughs> yeah it um because it's half term so i i have lots <laughs> of uh, lots of currently like little kids um rides out right outside my window playing i've, I've listened to the soundtrack to frozen go around about three times today which has slowly driven me mad you lucky, lucky man. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it's not as lovely as Whitney Bay, which I'm very much looking forward to seeing. Nicely done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and we will definitely see you in February. Looking forward. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thanks for having me. So it turns out that I'd actually lost this bit of paper and dropped it while I was shaking the hat. Just in case you didn't know who it was, it's Trevor Wood, who apparently always gets picked last. Trevor Wood has lived in Newcastle for 25 years and considers himself an adopted Geordie, though he reckons he still can't speak the language. He's a successful playwright who has also worked as a journalist and spin doctor for the City Council. And prior to that, he served in the Royal Navy for 16 years. Trevor holds an MA in creative writing from UEA. I always struggle to say that. His first novel, The Man on the Street, won the CWA John Creasy Dagger, the Crime Fest Specsavers Best Crime Debut Award and has also been shortlisted for the Thixon's Old Peculiar Crime Novel of the Year. Ooh. Trevor's second novel, One Way Street, is out now and I believe you have a third coming out next year, Trevor? Uh, that is right, um, back in uh, January, January the 20th. Very exciting. So what have you got for us this evening? Uh, well, I'm, I, like many others, I'm going to give you a sneak preview of... Um, the third and final book in the Jimmy Mullen trilogy, uh, which is called Dead End Street. Um, I'm not going to give you much of a preamble for those who don't know the series. Um, it's set in Newcastle's homeless community, uh, and that's all you really need to know. Uh, and this is the opening chapter. He likes sleeping with the dead. Some people might think it weird, but sod them and the horse they rode in on. There was a reason they talked about laying people to rest. Graveyards were an o oasis of calm, a place to think about where it all went wrong, or as in his case, how others had screwed it up for you and how you were going to make them pay. But this wasn't really a graveyard. It used to be, according to the sign by the road, on the other side of the grassy expanse where he was lying down. Ballast Hill's burial ground, was the place they put non-conformists in the 18th century. 
These days, it was practically invisible, unless you look very closely. On the surface, just a small park with a winding footpath around it, a footpath made up almost entirely of old gravestones. How many people have even noticed that they were literally walking over people's graves? The one beneath his feet read, burial place of Richard Dunn, cabinet maker, Henry, his son, died 18, uh, August the 5th, 1753, aged two years. It was one of several kids' graves scattered along the path. What a miserable fucking era to be born in. Two was no age to die. At least these days, most people manage to make th their three school years and ten. Most people. He reached into his rucksack, searching for another can of lager to take the edge off, but he was out of luck. Could have sworn there was one left. Instead, he pulled out a steak pie that someone had dropped in his lap earlier that day when he'd been sitting in a doorway on Dean Street, studying the passers-by, hiding from some, but mainly hoping to see his face. He hadn't been hungry then, but it was stone cold now, obviously. In his current circumstances, though, when life gave you a meat pie, you ate the bastard and enjoyed every last morsel of it. Voices carried to him on the wind, moving closer, and then footsteps coming up the stairway from the riverside. A few moments later, two men appeared by the entrance to the park, stopping as they caught sight of him, sitting on the grass. Though it was getting gloomy, he saw them put their heads together as if they were having some kind of chat before they started moving towards him again. He was new to this, but there was a bad vibe about them like the guys who'd chased him the other week. How he wished he'd stayed in that shed, ignored the screams, minded his own business like usual. He wolfed down the rest of the pie and started to get up. He was too late. His reactions dulled by one beer too many. They were almost on top of him now. A camera flashed in his face, momentarily blinding him. What are you doing? He cried, turning his head away and blinking furiously as he tried to clear his vision. Do you think it's him? One of the men said. Fuck if I know. They all look the same to me. You look familiar. We've seen you before. The first guy again. Maybe they really were the same ones who'd chased him. He looked back up at the taller of the two men. We thought I'd ask the question. Well, Lanky said. The man's voice was muffled by a scarf wound tightly around his mouth, but it was obvious he was local. Don't remember. Lanky laughed. Trust me, you'd remember us. Where are you from? Round and about. You don't sound like you're from round here, the second shorter man said, edging around his mate, closing off any possible escape route. If there were any doubts in his mind about the threat level, they disappeared. He glanced around looking for help. There was no one. Well, Shorty said, adjusting his old fashioned balaclava. Both men were clearly attempting to hide their faces. There was never a good reason for that. He needed to get out of there. I've been away. That right, how about you go away again? No problem, he said, struggling to his feet. If he was upright, he might be able to outrun them. Let me help you, Lanky said, holding out his hand. The man instinctively reached out to take it and was yanked up, too quickly to keep his balance, his rucksack slipping from his shoulder and falling to the ground. Lanky picked it up for him. Got your car keys in here, have you? I don't drive. Aye, oh, right. The tall man looked across at an old Nissan parked just across the road. Whose is that then? Not mine. Lanky felt around inside the rucksack, then checked the pockets on the outside. If he was going to run, now was the time. But all his worldly possessions were in that bag. He watched in horror as the contents were tipped out onto the ground. Back it in, he cried. Reaching out to grab the bag, his hand was slapped away, which stung like a bastard in the bitter cold. What did you do that for? Sorry, but my mum always taught me snatching the jewels. Here you go. Lanky held the rucksack out, but pulled it away again as he tried to grab it. Then the bastard did it again. Try saying please, his mate said, sniggering. Please, he muttered, ashamed of himself, but wanting this over. That's better, the tall prick said, holding out the bag. He reached for it again, but once more it was pulled away. Stop messing about, you twat, he said, immediately regretting it. Twat, am I? The tall man looked over to his friend. If you think I'm a twat, you haven't met my pal, he added. The kidney punch sent him down again, his head colliding with Lanky's knee, which was no accident. 
neither was the kick in the balls from behind, which had him rolling around on the ground. The kicks came fast and furious from then on, any pretense of this being anything other than a planned beating long gone, each kick punctuated by a word, fuck off back to Manchester or whatever shithole you crawled from, you benefit scrounging twat. He covered his head with his hands, but glimpsed one of the men's still toe cups through his fingers as it thudded into his face. Several teeth snapping, broken chunks falling into his mouth. Half choking on the bits of enamel and old films floating about in his throat, he tried to sit up. That only made him more open and the kicks reined in again. A rib cracked, then another. He moved his arms to his side to protect them, but got another boot in the face for his troubles. Through the blood, he saw one of the men, he'd lost track of which was which, slip a pair of knuckle dusters, knuckle dusters onto his hand. The first punch, punch broke his nose. The second crashed into the side of his head, making his ears ring. If he hadn't turned his head at the last minute, it would have knocked him out cold. When he looked up and saw the blade of the Stanley knife glinting in the light of the nearby lamppost, he almost wished it had. End of chapter one. Thanks so much, Trevor. So after Nikki singing, you were tempting yourself towards an accent there, weren't you? I was not attempting an accent at all, Simon. I don't. I'm not allowed. I noticed, I noticed the eye, and I thought <laughs> you were going to run with it there, but... Uh... <laughs> I'm no so, um, brave enough. So assuming you can find your way to Whitby Bay in February, I'm delighted that uh, I'm going to be moderating your session. Oh, fantastic. Um, it's going to be, having listened to Amen Sum reading, it's going to be the sweariest session you've yeah. ever heard, I think. So it's you, Amen, and Olivia Keenan. So um, yeah. talking about um, the, the locales and the influence <laughs> much, much more. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Pleasure, mate. Pleasure. And we will see you very soon. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Well, we let everyone get off because if, if we get off quickly, you, you might just avoid the car adverts and, and get to watch the long call uh, and Cleve's uh, ITV drama. And we do both want to say a huge thanks to Anne Cleves for all of her support with the event that is happening in February. Um, a reminder about the competitions, watch the end slides. We hope you jotted down the authors that you really, really enjoyed. And, and it's actually the most difficult competition we've ever run, I think, to choose just one author whose book you'd like to receive. Uh, but watch the slide that follows and then just email us with the one of the author's names that you see on the slide to be in with a chance uh, to win the, the book. Um, do email us um, at the same address if you've got any questions about the event. Um, we, we'll even try and do our trip advisor bit if you're coming outside of the area. But we hope to see as many of you as possible in February. And Vic, over to you to uh, round things out and I'll get the end slides ready. Well, thank you. Um, as usual, it's, it's my job to thank you all for joining us tonight. I haven't done VNAP B for so long that I forgot we usually have a quote of the week. Um, Susie Aspley has nominated Trevor Wood for Stung Like a Bastard and Eat Your Bastard Mince Pie. <laughs> so I think Trevor's going to win either way. Um, we really hope you've enjoyed it this evening. It's actually been lovely to do a VNAP B as well as doing as well as doing Bay Tales and hopefully we'll get to do Noir at the Bar very shortly too. Thank you as always to Jason Isaacs for our halftime music and big thanks to Leslie Cara, Nikki May, Russ Thomas, Amy McCulloch, Howard Linsky, Keitha Lodge, Trevor Wood and Vasim Khan and lots of love to Lauren North who's poorly this evening. Thank you to Simon and Schuster, Penguin, Michael, Joseph, Quirkus and Transworld too and if you are in the northeast um this weekend and you're coming to the Living North Christmas Fair from Thursday to Sunday, do come by our stand and say hello. We're looking forward to welcoming as many of you as possible to Whitley Bay on February the 12th. But in the meantime, you can join us virtually on the 24th of November for Bay Tales Live. Thank you everybody and see you on the 24th of November. Night night. night.